Today's scripture comes from Romans 8, 18 to 28. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. You may be seated. It's a great joy to be here with you this morning. Um, I haven't been in Vancouver in in 10 years, so it's really good to be here and um, and have the privilege to speak to you. I, after our first service, I realized that I met somebody who has was a member here who has a sister at our church, so we're already like family that way. Uh, it's pretty neat to, to, to do that. Um, as this passage was read to us, um, something to, to consider that is that on any given day, um, people go through suffering and hardship in various ways. And in such a moment, it's tempting to ponder when difficult things happen and suffering takes place, uh, what possible good comes out of this? And uh, pastorally speaking, I get this question regularly from people. Um, Well, let me give you two examples of things that happen in a local church. It's happened in our church. Uh, First, uh, a member receives a phone call from their doctor and they've been diagnosed with cancer. Second, Someone else gets the phone call and they find out from their test that their pregnancy is not viable once again. Both believe in Christ and they're wondering why God would allow for this to happen. Both genuinely believe that God is sovereign over all things, but still it hurts to find out that your life is being altered. They're trying to make sense of the suffering and why God would allow it and how he might work all this out in light of his sovereignty. Well, it seems that the Apostle Paul knew that the Christians in Rome in the first century may have been struggling with the same questions in light of their suffering and that we're asking today as well. So, led by the Spirit, he helps them understand that in the midst of suffering, God is helping us through the Holy Spirit and sovereignly working it out for our good and his glory? In fact, today's passage, in it, Christ's followers are given one of the greatest encouragement in all of Scripture. We just listen to verse 18 to 28. My primary focus is going to be verse 28, but the wider context matters a lot. So let me pray with you for illumination. Father, we pray that through the Holy Spirit, you would illuminate our minds and our hearts as we consider the truth of the gospel together. In Christ's name, amen. Romans 8 is considered one of the greatest chapters in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul lays out traveling instructions for Christ's followers as they live in a fallen world marked by suffering and brokenness. Despite bad circumstances, pain and even great fear, uh, grief, Paul says Christ's followers can know and experience God's joy in the present and eagerly await joy in the future. And that's how he really, you know, he begins this chapter in, in Romans 8 in verses 1 to 4. He talks about the basis of one's spiritual life. 
Namely, that there's no condemnation and there is no bondage because of the work of the Holy Spirit who enables us to live a new life in Christ. And then from verse 5 to 17, he talks about the primary work of the Holy Spirit, namely to make Christ's followers more like Jesus. And then by the time we arrive at verse 20, 18 to 27, 28, what was read today, Paul is describing three groanings that are happening in a fallen world. Who is groaning is the question. Well, in 18 to 28, we see that creation is groaning as a result of Adam's sin, but doing so in hope. And then in 23 to 25, we see God's people are groaning, but with hope. And third, in 26 and 27, we see that the Holy Spirit is groaning, aiding believers with assurance that our hope in Jesus will not disappoint. But why is this happening? Well, because creation is stuck and we are stuck in sinful and decaying bodies. Both creation and us, we await a future resurrection. So the Holy Spirit is groaning in us because he makes up for all the helplessness we have when we don't know what to pray. Unknown to us, he brings before God the prayer that perfectly matches God's will. So here's the point that I want to emphasize to you. The main point of my talk this morning is this, that God's eternal purpose causes everything to work together for good. God's eternal purpose causes everything to work together for good. This is meant to transform the way Christ followers face the good, the bad, and the deep difficulties of life. Two observations from this passage. Number one being this, God works all things, even the bad, for our ultimate good. Paul does not say that things will simply work together on their own. No, rather at the heart of this verse, verse 28, is God, who is sovereignly governing the visible and invisible factors of life for our good. The gospel tells us this is true because we live in a fallen world, and we know by nature suffering exists and bad things happen every day. It's a reminder that circumstances for Christ's followers are no better than anyone else's. It means that terrible things can happen to people who love God. In the global West, there's a tendency for Christians to buy the idea, if we love and serve God, then we will have not as many bad things happen to us. But today's passage says that's not true. He wants us to know that horrible things can happen to believers and who love and serve God, and that will not keep us from experiencing those things. The phrase all things is to be understood the totality of everything. Nothing is missed. So God is working out in the totality of all things his plans and purposes. So we don't get a free pass in this life from bad things that happen to people in a fallen world, even if we love God. It's critical that we understand this, otherwise we have a very skewed version of the gospel. This helps us recognize that when we experience good things, such as health, loving relationship, it is because God is working all things together. That is his grace. It also means that when we're experiencing bad things, like bad health, financial trouble, relational disunity, war as it's happening right now, or persecutions of sorts, that is still God working all things together and there his grace is sufficient. Just like when Paul asked the Lord to remove the thorn from his side, the Lord responded by saying, my grace is sufficient and it was to keep him humble. God is working out his plans and purposes in Paul's life. So here's the obvious implication. Although bad things happen, God works them for good. The good that Paul is talking about in verse 28 does not refer to the health and wealth that the world pushes on us. Instead, God uses all things, everything in life, including our suffering, to accomplish his purpose. He's orchestrating all things in his great wisdom and power for the good of all who believe in him, 
so that we, become, we may become like his son. We see in verse 29 that the ultimate good that you and I as Christ followers can experience is to be conformed to the image of Christ so that he can preserve us until we finally are glorified with him. About a year ago, I was having a meal with one of our leaders, our denominational leaders, and I had been having a rough time with my migraines. I live with almost daily migraines, like a 7 out of 10. And so, and that was also because I've had many eye surgeries. And so once he found out about my eye surgeries and migraines, he made a very interesting observation. He said, I wonder what God is trying to accomplish and teach you through this. And I agreed with him. In fact, that God continues to teach me that I must rely on his grace and know that he's conforming me more and more into the image of his son who died for my sins. Now, Paul doesn't say here that bad things are good. Rather, he says that they are bad, but God is still working it out for our ultimate good so we can be like his son. When the Lord Jesus in John 11 stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, he wasn't thinking, oh, well, I'm about to show them my glory and power. Just stop crying. No. He stood there and he wept. He was still in control of the situation, but he still wept. Why? Because death and suffering is a bad thing. Even though he was about to work it for good, he first cried. Sometimes we over-spiritualize things or adopt an unhealthy view of suffering and say, well, you know, bad things are really a blessing in disguise or that every cloud has a silver lining. But the Bible never says that. Instead, we're told that bad things are really bad. But God in his grace works it out for our ultimate good. Tim Keller puts it this way. Jesus hates loneliness, pain, suffering, and death. All so much that he was willing to come into the world and experience it himself so that eventually he could destroy it without destroying us. The Lord never promises to reveal how every bad thing in our lives works out for our good. But he does promise that he can take whatever bad circumstances and work it out for our ultimate good. So it's important that we see Romans 8.28 in its proper context. Otherwise, it's easy to use it and abuse it for all kinds of unintended purposes and be left frustrated. And often this happens, friends, when we take scripture out of context. You know, it's easy to have what we call a little blessing box and rip some verses out and put it in there and try to sort of claim that for what it's not intended to. For example, people can use Romans 8.28 to assure themselves that when bad things happen, then surely good will come. Or when I didn't get the job that I wanted, I can say, well, that's because there's a better one waiting for me somewhere there. Or when I didn't get to marry the girl I wanted to, See, maybe that means there's someone better for me somewhere else out there. And there's so many ways to apply that verse in the wrong way. This doesn't mean that God doesn't care about mature blessing. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care about our relationship. Indeed, God cares that we carefully choose a life partner. God cares about all of those things, that we pray for those things. The point we must not miss is that if we're prone to apply this verse in a purely materialistic way, then it fails to consider the spiritual reality that is ultimately more important than the material reality. John Newton, the 18th century hymn writer, puts it this way, everything is necessary that God sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. He draws the conclusion that if God withholds something good from you, then he would only be good in the short run. In the long run, it would be terrible It may be good, but only in part, not in the totality of your life. But God can also allow bad things to come our way in order to cure us of the things that can destroy us in the long run. Now, what are the things that can destroy us in the long run? They are pride, selfishness, hardness of heart, and the belief that leads me to think, I don't need God. It is a declaration of independence from God who made, not only made us, but is the God who can save us and bring us to glory. 
So in the short run, um, selfishness or self-deception may feel great. But in the long run, it'll destroy us. Now, if you're not a Christ follower, friend, if you're not someone who has personally turned and trusted in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, today's passage tells us that all the temporary good that you and me can seek after right now can and will never deliver on its promise, nor will it give you hope. In fact, the good that you seek after apart from God will keep you blinded and one day it'll be too late. Success can harden our hearts and make you think that you have achieved all this with your hard work, that you're the master of your soul and the captain of your ship. Friend, the gospel tells us that the good that you need must come from another, from outside of you, and that the other is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, where sinners are given the greatest good, so that in trusting in him, their souls will eternally prosper. So if the Holy Spirit is at work in your mind and in your heart, then you must go to him with empty hands and humble hearts that you may turn and trust in his good work at the cross. And if you do, be assured of this, that he's ready to save you. For Christ's followers, an application for us to consider is this. We must see conformity to Christ as our greatest good. What that does is that takes into consideration not just a temporary, but the totality of what God is doing in and through our lives. Even what life seems to be going in the wrong direction, we can bring our fears and anxieties to Him. Why? Because God is at the heart of all of this. We can say if life has not gone wrong, why? Because God is working all things together for good. And if God is sovereignly working all things for eternal good, there are no accidents. There are no blind chance or fate. I grew up with this kind of thinking. I grew up in a Hindu home. There's a lot of superstition I lived with. But in the gospel, all those things are undone because God is sovereign. Sin is terrible and has consequences, and we have to deal with it. But God in his greatness weaves all our messed up into the ultimate good. On this side of eternity, we're not always shown how God is working all things together. But one day, he'll reveal his great work. I often think of the story of Corrie Tan Boom, who tells of how she was put in a concentration camp with her sister. And there her sister died and God miraculously released her. And Corrie Tan Boom spent the next 40 years telling people of God's goodness in the gospel. And one of the ways she illustrates this is she would uh, help our audience see the reality of God is working all things for believers good, she would show one, the backside of her tapestry. And the backside um, looks pretty messy. Um, if you ever turn the carpet and you'll see at the back that looks pretty bad. And I often say it looks like a throw up. There's nothing good that looks there. And so often we feel like that about our lives, even as Christ followers. Wake up and think, I feel terrible especially when things are not spanning out as we hoped. But then she would turn to the right side and show the crown, the finished work in its totality. So what we must often remember is, remember side by side, the back side of a tapestry that looks really messy, and we're trying to figure out how this is going to all look. Well, sometimes God gives us the other picture, the totality. In Scripture, we do see it ultimately in Revelation. Corey Tamboom would say this, although the threads of my life have often seemed knotted, I know by faith that on the other side of the embroidery, there's a crown. And there's a crown, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, awaiting all who faithfully live for the Lord. Knowing that God is working all things together for good by faith and not by sight. Someday all believers will go to heaven and God will let us see the front side of that tapestry. And there we will fully understand his loving and good design for our lives. We must trust God, any God who would send his own son to ransom you and me can be utterly trusted to take full care of the details of our lives. Here's our second observation. God works for the good of those who love him. 
It's not hard to look at verse 28 and just read portion of it. And all things God works for good. Paul doesn't just stop there. He says, it is for those who are called according to his purpose. So it's not a universal, so anyone and everyone promise. It is for those whom God has called, meaning those whom he has awaked from spiritual deadness and brought us into a relationship with his son. So the implication is that all things do not work for the good of those who do not love God. Romans 1.24, Paul says that God gave them, those who reject him, over to the desires of their hearts. So one of the worst punishments God gives is to let people have the desires of their own sinful hearts. Thus we end up living under the illusion that we're in control of our lives. But Christ, Christ followers are called to live a way that separates us from the way of life the unbelieving world lives. But it doesn't call us to live in isolation of the world, rather to live in word and deed as Christ followers. So the world around us is able to hear the gospel and thus bring glory to God and give them credible reason to seek after the Lord. As John talked about uh, Alpha being run in your homes, you'd want to people be attracted because they see your life. They have relationships with you and say there's something about your faith that I'm attracted to. And I want to explore this. So the implication here is this. Life's troubles are part of God's loving purposes for us. All things tells us that all things have that have ever happened to us or can possibly happen to us are ordered and controlled by God so that the end result is inescapably and utterly good. Even the worst things are used to make us like Christ. What is more, when we begin to look closely, we see that they are used not only for our good purpose, for the good of others as well. So if God is using these things, good and the bad, for our ultimate good, it doesn't stop with us. The implication is others are blessed by it. The more Christ followers become like him, the more we are a blessing to others. And so that's important. And over the years, I've thought of the story of Joseph so often. I marvel at how God controls even the smallest of circumstances. Most of what, what God was doing was hidden from Joseph for years. You know that he went through a, a terrible experience as a young man. God gave him two dreams. And after that, he, he thought he was going to be the leader and they're going to bow. And very naive of him, because his brother sold him out, almost killed, into slavery, Potiphar's home, accused, falsely accused in prison. And he, I often wondered what his thought process was when he was going through all of that. What was God doing? Well, he tells his brothers in chapter 50 of Genesis that you intended harm for me, but God intended it for good. To do what? To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. We learn that God accomplishes his purposes and keeps his promise of blessing through events we would never plan for ourselves. Never. We're not sovereign. We're limited in wisdom and in power, and God is infinite in wisdom and power. So let me close by telling you my story. I was born to a Hindu family in Sri Lanka, and we immigrated to Germany in the mid-80s. And then a few years later, we moved to France. And in 1989, we moved here to Montreal, Quebec. And by the time we arrived here, I was turning 10. And, and then we moved to Toronto at the end of that year. And so here I am at age 10 trying to learn English as my fourth language and being very confused and hitting a wall. But I do remember in those years struggling with two questions constantly that came to me. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Is there a purpose to all of it? And if I die, will that even matter? Some deep questions for a 10-year-old. <laughs> and then belonging. Like, where do I find belonging? Where I, am be where I have value, where I am truly loved. And I struggled with those. And both of those things were elusive. And my worldview as a Hindu, I, I couldn't make sense of these things. And so uh, what I eventually 
where I found some temporary belonging and purpose was in sports. And I grew up playing soccer and basketball and, and friends in the community. And I struggled, even as we grew up in the community, with being bullied and, and with learning a new language and, and, and just struggling with friendships. And so, and people would laugh at me because I couldn't speak the language properly. And in my community, where I grew up in the east end of Toronto, um, lots of the kids from my background were being bullied by others. And that led a number of us to form a group to protect ourselves, eventually became a gang, and it changed very quickly. And so I had this sort of affiliation with the gang, but I was still, because of my culture, like education is everything. And if you don't finish, like it's big failure. So I was still doing school, I was in my IT program, and I was fast tracking. I thought I was in control of my life. I thought I was sovereign, that I have the last say of everything that's gonna happen. And so in 1999, so that's 24 years ago, I was about to graduate from my IT program and I just finished my job interview and they said, okay, you want you to come and work for our company. And, um, and I thought, great. And I was dating a young lady. I thought I'm gonna get married by 22 and my life was set. Well, none of that ever happened because my best friend was brutally beaten up by another gang. And my friends and I, in anger, decided to retaliate. And what happened that one summer day was that it ended up being gun violence between two groups of people, and a number of people were injured and shot, including myself. I shouldn't be alive, I shouldn't be in front of you today, but God, in his mercy, preserved my life that day. And two weeks later, I was arrested with a group of guys and incarcerated for gang violence. And while I was there, I was losing my mind because instead of graduating, instead of living this life that I thought I had planned, all of it was gone, all of it. And so there I spoke to another inmate and I said, can you get me something to read? And like I said, because English was my fourth language, I don't like reading. And I did the minimum, that's why I went to IT. There was no essay writing. Um, and so, God just brought me to the lowest point. And uh, as this, this guy knocked on the door and, and there was this vent for air to flow and he pushed his book through, literally opened it this way and pushed it through and I pulled it in and I looked at the cover and it said, the Holy Bible, placed there by the Gideons. And I opened it up, I didn't know where to start. Uh, because up until that point, when I looked at the Bible or thought of Christianity, I thought of as a Western colonial white religion that had nothing to do with people of my background. But yet, as I read from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and by the time I arrived in chapter 3, I realized these people are messed up just like me. And something from the very first reading kept me going, and I look back now, I just know that that was the work of the Holy Spirit, giving me a desire that I never had in my life to read something that I wouldn't want to touch. And so by the time, uh, with the recommendation of other inmates, uh, I began to read the New Testament. And so there I was in Matthew chapter 5, reading, coming under the conviction, when Jesus says that if you're angry at your brother, you're guilty of murder. If you're lust after woman, you're guilty of adultery. That he took the issue to the heart and realized that the heart is stained with sin. And thus was being laid low. And as volunteers would come into the prison, I would have these conversations. And this one particular conversation in September of 1999 was this. That I said, look, I, I'm a Hindu. I've been reading the Bible for two months now. And I'm trying to grasp this reality that God of the Bible is personal. It's a forgiving God. It's a God who saves sinners and gives us new life. Am I reading this right? And the guy looked at me, he's like, yes, this is the gospel. And so there, the Lord, through the work of the Spirit, led me to repent and put my trust in Jesus Christ. Now, the doors didn't swing open. I didn't walk out. I was still there. So when I read about Paul and, and the guys in prison... None of that worked for me. <laughs> Why? God was working all things. I just didn't see how he was going to work at all things at that point. But this volunteer would come and disciple me. We read the Bible, we talk about it, and we would pray. And 
people in there would say, you're changed, you're different when you talk and the way you care. And, and so the Lord just used that time to disciple me and grow me more and more into the image of his son. And then I got transferred to the federal penitentiary and I got there and they said, oh, well, because of gang violence, you're going to go to maximum security unit. And so uh, Millhaven Institution at that time was the most violent prison in all of Canada. And there you're locked up 23 hours a day. And it's very easy to get depressed. And it's very easy to start and getting into violence in there. And I remember God saying in his word, uh, when a man's ways please the Lord, he'll even make his enemies be at peace with him. I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you to help me not just survive, but live and, and thrive. You did it with Joseph who ran away from sin. Can you do it to me who ran into sin? And God in his mercy did that. And, and eventually I got the opportunity to work in there to be trained as a counselor. So I worked as a, a mental health counselor, counseled people on infectious diseases and suicide prevention. I never knew how God was going to use all of that later on. So I worked with my peers in there to do that. And then long story short, everywhere I got transferred to, God sovereignly sent one older man, a mature Christian from the community as a volunteer to come and disciple me. Paul says to the Corinthians, when I was a boy, I taught like a boy and acted like a boy. And then I became a man and I put childish things away. And this discipleship was really the maturing process. And the affirmation of, we think God is doing this in your life, we want to affirm that in your life. And so over the years, from transferring from one person to another, this was constant. And I was scared. Like, how am I supposed to serve God? People who know my background, why would they want to accept me? And thus people would remind me, don't forget David. Don't forget Saul, who wrote much of the New Testament, that God changed him and used him. And so... Um, while I was in prison, while I knew my, my release was nearing, I had applied to a Bible college and said, well, clearly I'm still incarcerated, but I'm applying. <laughs> Will you guys accept me because I need training? And, uh, and they did. And so by the time I was released, I had spent just over nine years incarcerated, from 19 to 28. And in those years, the Lord did a work that I could have never planned for my life. And he was merciful. There were many hard days, many hard months, but God, through every disappointment, worked all it out for my ultimate good. And so not only that, but after coming and going to school for the next two years, from IT to theology, it was two different worlds. And um, I began to pray, and the Lord brought my wife into my life. So Vijay and I now have been married 13 years and in his providence, we have four children, two boys and two girls. And um, I say all of this to that, that day in 1999, I didn't know what I was getting into. I knew it was going to be violent, but I knew how God was going to redeem all of that. And so in his grace and mercy, God led us to plant a church nine years ago. And we're on the east side of Toronto, very close to UFT Scarborough. Now, um, one last story. A year ago, one of our members called me, and, and, and she's in school at seminary in the U.S. right now, and said, I want to pray for you for your birthday. And um, she's like a daughter to my wife and I. And so in her prayer, she um, began to say, Lord, I thank you how you took my pastor uh, as a young Hindu boy, and you brought him to prison, and there you gave him a Bible, and there you opened his eyes, and there you saved him. And through these years, you worked in his life, and then you brought him out. And then one day, God, you brought him to this youth camp, and he was the speaker. And there I came to faith, she says in her prayer. And then years later, she joins our church plant. And then we invite her to be our intern as a student intern, as a university student. And in her internship, she realizes that her gift of teaching to children is something that she didn't realize, and we affirm her in that. And then now... She's at seminary preparing to go to the mission field. And she goes, God, thank you for bringing him through all of this so that we can be affected through this. And really had me in tears while she was praying for me on my birthday. I'm like, you have just undone me by praying and reminding me that God works all things for the good of those who love him. What did, why? Why did this young lady pray such a bold prayer and give thanks to God for my utter foolishness? That's the point of Romans 8.28, namely that God's eternal purpose 
causes everything to work together for good. So, believers, can anything possibly come into our lives that can defeat God's plan? There are many things that can come to defeat human planning, but nothing can defeat God's plan. That means you and I can go in confidence that even when we're most perplexed or cast down, that God is at work. For Romans 8 serves to remind us that in Christ there is no condemnation, no separation, and ultimately no defeat. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you work all things together, even the bad, for our good. So I pray for those who have not trusted in your good work at the cross, and I pray for those of us who have, that you keep our eyes focused on what you're doing and trusting you by faith that one day we will see the full picture. But between now and then, that we'd follow you by faith and knowing you're working it all out for your glory and our good. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you.